QuickBooks Online 2023 e-commerce inventory Excel first in first out FIFO practice problem part number two. Get ready to earn the skills needed to boost your bank books on up with QuickBooks Online 2023. Here we are in our QuickBooks Online test company file using the accountant view as opposed to the business view. You can toggle between the two views by going to the cog up top and switching the view on down below. Duplicating some tabs to put reports in by right clicking the tab up top to duplicate it. Right clicking the tab up top to duplicate it. Back to the tab to the middle. We're going to the reports on the left hand side. We want once again that balance sheet report as it's thinking. Tap into the right as we do every time. Reports on the left. This time the profit and loss, the income statement. I'm going to close the hamburger, change the range. Let's make this time the range is going to go from 040124 tabs to 053124 tab. For that two month period let's also see it on a side by side with the month by month so i'm going to make it month breakout over here and then run it and then tabbing it to the middle closing up the hamburger put the range to the same here at 0401 support accounting instruction by clicking the link below giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website broken out by category further broken out by course each course then organized in a logical reasonable fashion making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a youtube page we also include added resources such as excel practice problems pdf files and more like quickbooks backup files when applicable so once again click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it one two four two oh five thirty one two four let's do it a month by month side by side as well and run that report back to the tab to the left we've been looking at e-commerce situation selling inventory but not on ground in a store but rather online in the cloud with the help use support of third-party applications for example being like a shopify or and amazon we've been looking at inventory flow assumptions breaking out the inventory from the sales side of things using a periodic system for the inventory method and we're using a first in first out with the help and support of our excel worksheet which we started out last time so if you didn't if you didn't see the last time presentation with this particular practice problem you probably want to look at this because we're on part number two at this point so we entered the first month of of data into our excel worksheet just as a recap we've been buying the inventory as we need it and then periodically at the end of the month we counted the inventory that we have left we determined then using our first in first out method what then ending inventory should be on i'm going to delete these items here on a uh first in first out periodic based system and then we went over here into our worksheet and we adjusted the ending inventory with a journal entry to match out and we recorded the other side to cost of goods sold quickbooks now reflecting properly hopefully our financial statements but the subsidiary reports in order to in order to sub to to back up those numbers are basically being done in excel now we're imagining we're just going to move on to the next month and we're going to do the same kind of thing i'm going to i'm going to imagine we have our inventory that's in our third party platform that we're selling on like a shopify or amazon we're tracking the units of inventory as we purchase inventory we're going to say we're low on inventory in terms of units we're going to then purchase more inventory and we'll increase the number of units as we do so and then on a perpetual inventory system just for the units the the online platform will decrease the number of inventory as we make our sales and then of course our goal on the excel worksheet is to convert that from a unit basis to a flow assumption so we can get a dollar amount for the similar kind of process so we're going through we're saying okay we need to purchase more stuff in the following month of may now so i'm going to go back on over and say all right let's imagine that according to to our estimates we need more stuff to sell and so i'm going to say on five one now notice i put a table around this as i add each line item to the table it should 
extend the table as I add a line item. So for example, we're gonna imagine that we're gonna add uh, six more items of item number one. Now note, I can I might wanna sort this. You can also sort it over here. It's sorted by date, for example, uh, with these filters. That's why those filters are quite nice. So I'm gonna say, all right, on five, one, and notice when I hit enter, it extended the table. I'm gonna say that we purchased six more of product. I gotta make sure I get the exact name so that my filtering works well. Product number one. I've got product number one, but I'm gonna put them on there one at a time. So, and I'm gonna say that the unit cost of them this time is going to be $27. So the, the no, it's gonna be $23. So the cost was $20, inflation happened or something, it went up to 23. So I'm gonna copy this down one, two, three, four, five, because I wanna have six lines that have that same information in it. I'm gonna copy these down we, uh, here, because those are our totals that need to be brought down as well. And so if I look at those, does that make sense? We've got six items. I put them on there one at a time, one, two, three, four, five, six of them. You can see the physical count over here as well as the summing, therefore the total dollar amount for those would be 138. Now, if you, if you bought these in one lump sum and you had other expenses that were related to it, for example, you might say, hey, look, I paid 138 for it. And then you would just divide that by six, right? And that would be in essence, your unit cost for uh, those products. Let's also say that we bought uh, on five, three. So, so, well, let's, that's gonna happen on five one. Did we purchase anything else on five one? No, let's keep it at that. So now we're gonna go into our system and I'm just gonna say this would come through the bank feed. So the purchasing side is in essence on a cash based system in that we should see the money going out of the checking account to tell us when to record the transaction as opposed to the decrease to, to inventory because we have to do that on a basically a, a, a periodic basis using our accrual concept. So I'm gonna say this is gonna be vendor one and we'll just say this happened on 0501 uh, two, four, we're making a purchase here. It's just going to increase inventory like it does every time. And I'm just going to put the new dollar amount, which happens to be, what did I say it was? We're going to sum up these items. It costs $138. So one, 138, boom. This is going to increase inventory. The other side's going to go to the, the, uh, checking account decrease. It's going to decrease checking account, increase inventory. All right, save it and let's run it so checking account goes down inventories are going up now so inventory if i look in may's inventory then we've got that increase on five one very good nothing if i exit this out if i go into my my uh, income statement no cost of goods sold yet for may because we're going to figure that out at the end of May, even though sales have been taking place possibly already, we're not going to, we're not going to do the decrease of inventory and cost of goods sold until the end of the month. All right. And then let's say that time passes and over here on our platform, we're still tracking on in essence, a perpetual inventory system with regards to the units of inventory, because when I purchased those inventory units, I would have increased them to you know, product number one, and then sales would have happened over time, but I'm not decreasing the inventory in my worksheet for sales. However, they would be decreased over here on a perpetual method because, because this is tracking just the units on a perpetual method. And I might say, okay, now I need to purchase more stuff in, in the month of, of May. So I'm just gonna say, all right, I need more stuff to, to deal with logistically uh, keeping up with demand over here. So this is so on 515. On 515, we're going to say that we purchased two more of these product ones. Product one. We purchased two more of those. And I'm going to put them on one at a time. But now they cost $27. Inflation killing us. So they go on up in cost, even though they're the same units. I put them on there two times. So that cost me $54 for those two. 
I could copy these down. These need to copy down. And then I'm also gonna buy on the same day, 515, we're gonna buy three units of product number, of product number uh, two. So product two, we're gonna buy uh, three units of those and they now cost one, 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 uh, $111 of product for product number two. They used to cost 105, so now they cost 111. I'm gonna put them on the books individually. So two more of those. So they cost us uh, $333. We can copy these down again. And then we've got also on 515, we purchased three of product number three. And we're gonna say that they cost us 675. So once again, inflation happened. Hold on, these need to go on the books one at a time. One, 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 and then one. And then these cost six, seven, five. Hopefully I didn't confuse you too bad there. They used to cost 650. So again, inflation hit us again. And we're gonna copy those and paste them here. Boom, and we'll copy these down. So now we've added these to the books. Sales have been happening, but we're not recording the sales yet for May. We're just going to record the sales at one time, just like we did over here at, at the end of, at the end of this whole process. So let's say, okay, then what does that add up to? I'm going to say all this stuff happened. Uh, I could say from here to here. So it cost us, uh, two, four, one, two, two, four, one, two. And, and again, if, if you were buying product by product, product one, two and three and so on, like if I was buying these three products and it, if the total came out to 2025 total cost, including everything, sales tax and whatnot that's included, I can take that number divided by three and that would be basically my unit price that I would be putting into my worksheet per unit. It, you can get a little bit more complex, of course, if you're, if you're buying multiple different products at one time to try to figure out what the unit cost is for each product when you get into sales tax and whatnot but you can come up with a with a ratio method to kind of allocate you know sales tax and whatnot properly uh to the products even though you're paying possibly you know a lump sum amount we want to break it out by product so that we can put it on our sheet over here okay so now we've but in our excel sheet we're just going to pay let's say one vendor again for the 2004 12. so i'm going to say all right Let's go back on over here. It's gonna come out of my checking account. So I will see it hitting the checking account, expenses. And we'll just say this is gonna be vendor one again. And this happened on 515. And we'll say that this was inventories going, going up by the number, I can't remember. I just said it, 2004, 12, 2004, 12, 2004, 12. And this will decrease the checking account, increase inventory once again. So let's save it and close it. Time has passed. And now we've got the inventory. Uh, we boosted it back up here in May for the two purchases that happened in May. We don't have any sales yet in May, meaning we did actually have sales. We haven't recorded them in QuickBooks because we're going to record and, and notice we, we would have recorded the sales half of the sales, but we're not recording the decrease of the inventory part of the sales of inventory that we had because that we're doing on a periodic system. If I then go on over to my profit and loss, nothing's over here for May in the profit and loss. Notice that the income line would have income because the income is tying in to the to the format that we pulled in the income from, which might be QuickBooks integration or using a manual journal entry method or whatever method we use that we talked about in prior presentations. We're focusing now on the cost of goods sold. And notice I put this one into cost of labor. Uh, I think it should have gone. Let's actually fix that. I'm going to go into that. It's not labor. What are you talking about? I think I have a cost of goods sold account. Let's put it into cost of goods sold, straight up cost of goods. Save it. 
All right, that's probably what's bothering people. And I don't want to bother people unnecessarily. All right, so there's that. And then we're going to imagine the end of the month rolls around again. And if I go on over to my, my Shopify then, I can see the units that are basically being tracked on like a perpetual system, even though I'm only updating my worksheet on a periodic system monthly. In other words, over here, I've been, I had my beginning balances from last month. I added the purchases when I purchased them so that it's reflected in my Shopify so I can cover my sales and it's being decreased in terms of units when the sales actually happen by Shopify or whatever online platform you're dealing with. And you can tie that out to the physical count as well and make sure that this number you know ties out to the physical inventory and then we're going to take out whatever the physical inventory is which should be reflected here in this number on your online platform and say i'm going to assume the difference between that inventory and what i currently have in my worksheet are sales right so i'm going to go back on over here and say let's break this out one by one again product by product so then i can say i can adjust my products because I have them all in this nice worksheet. This is what the nice thing is about the worksheet. I could say, let's sort my products by just product number one. And then say that, that as of the end of the time frame, we have units left of product number one, four units left of product number one. So I'm going to say, okay, that means that I sold, and maybe it would be easier to do in the table over here. If I said I had four products left, right? I have eight in my little table minus the four. So I sold uh, four products would be the general idea. So I'm going to go back on over here and say, okay, uh, we sold four. Now notice if you had more information than the end of April, you can also filter by date. I mean, at the end of May. So if you had more information in June and you're trying to figure out where you stand at the end of may you can use your filtering options here to see your table for this this time frame but now we're gonna say okay so we sold four of these items on five let's say 531 so 531 and i have to format my date fields here so let's go ahead and just copy the formatting here and i'll put that all the way down to my table and i'll say this is on 531 we sold four of these. They're all going to be on there one at a time. The cost is going to equal the cost of this line item. So it'll it'll tie out and map out. So the, the number of units left, of course, is zero. That's this minus this. And the ending inventory is this minus this. There's nothing left because we sold this ending inventory. These two need to reflect nothing. And we're going to say that we sold... Let's do that four... Uh, a couple more times. I'm going to copy this one, two, three more times. So there's the four that we sold, putting them on there one at a time, and it's picking up then the reflected amounts, which are all the same here because they all cost $23. It wasn't until we got down here that we had uh, higher costs per unit. Notice I'm filtering by product and I'm also sorting it by date in order to to pick up the right line items on a first in first out inventory method okay so now let's imagine that uh, product product number two we had five we still have five on hand so we didn't sell any of product number two and then product number three let's imagine that we have two on hand on the physical count that means we sold five of them so we sold five of those items so I'm just going to go back on over here and say, let's sort this by product number three. I'll filter it, in other words, or more properly. Product number three, and we sold, I said, what did I say? We sold, now I, now I deleted it. But we sold five of them. All right, so we're going to say on 531, we sold five, and I have to do the date thing again. Let's select this whole column and format this thing so that I have the date like that. Okay, so this is 531 and we sold five of them and uh, the units out are gonna be one each time and the cost is the 650. 
I'm gonna copy that down four more times. One, two, three, four. So that we have five of them. One, two, three, four, five. Counting at the five. And so this is the cost of uh, those particular items. And notice that there's a difference in the cost for right here. That's the problem because now we sold five of them and some of them cost 650, some of them cost 675. And so we're saying that we sold the ones that cost 650 first, and then we're eating into the 675 ones, noting that in an inflationary time frame, we're left with the ones that are more expensive, the higher priced ones. So, so meaning our our balance sheet is going to be reflecting the the items that are cost more, even though they're the same units in a first in first out inflation. If there's an inflation or increase in time in price time frame. All right, so that's going to be that. So now I'm going to let's unfilter this again. I'm going to say let's take the filters off. Boom. And so now I'm going to delete this stuff. We're going to say this should tie out to what we have in our Indian units. Like I've got four uh, units of product one, five, product two, and product three has three. And this is according to our, our formulas that we put up last time. We could also do it like a pivot table. So we have that. We might do a pivot table in a second just for the fun of it. But we've got that. And then, uh, and then now we've got the total this is what our ending inventory should be. So our ending inventory over here in QuickBooks is currently at 5360. It's going to be higher because we've been purchasing stuff but not recording the sales. 5360. So we're going to have to bring it down. This minus this adjustment is going to be 3364 to get ending inventory to that. So I'm going to say, all right, let's just do a journal entry, periodic a journal entry new button and we're going to do a journal entry and we'll do it as of the end of may this time and we'll say that is going to be a debit to cost of goods sold see if i can pick the right one and we'll say that was for the amount of three three six seven so three three six seven and the other side is going to go to inventory Four three three six seven. Let's go ahead and save it and close it. And the balance sheet running it. So now we've got our ending inventory over here at the one nine nine three. And does that tie out one nine nine three? So that's what we wanted it to be. And then the cost of goods sold is going to be over here. Cost of goods sold. Run it. So now we've got our cost of goods sold for May of the 3367, which is of course the calculation that uh, we made for this item. You can also basically see that in our table over here. If I was to filter on, on this date field for the sales dates, and I just wanna see the items I'm gonna, that were in May. So I've got the May items and I'm gonna say, okay. And I've, I've unfiltered everything else. And I can go in here and say, okay, this is the cost column. If I select the whole thing, that comes out to the 3367. So that's another way you can kind of double check and sort your data. So now over here, notice the sales would be happening using the method we looked at before, possibly with like the, the Intuit integration with a Shopify or Amazon or, or uh, eBay or whatever. And then these cost of goods sold will hopefully match up more properly to the proper time periods, which will give us better, you know, matching information so that we can make decisions on what we're going to purchase in the future and what our costing, our costing should be. And again, we could try to map this out by product, for example, which gets a little bit more detail so we can think about our profit margins, you know, on a per product type of basis and whatnot, so we can go through our inventory decision making but the bottom line is that now we've got these hopefully timed out properly we're doing it on a periodic mace, uh, method adjusting at the end of the period we have our inventory item number over here which should be correct from a financial standpoint but doesn't have the backup or support within quickbooks of the unit amounts and and the flow assumption because that is being done on a periodic method in our worksheet on this side now before we wrap this one up let's just note that you could make like a pivot table out of this 
data over here as well, which sometimes could be a useful way to see it. So let's get rid of the filters right here and say, let's remove the filters and everything is selected. And I'm just gonna add a pivot table so we can kind of see that format as well. So we're basically gonna rebuild this table, but do it with a pivot table, which is kind of easier to do in some ways, but I kind of like the hard formulas as well, but you know, different people have different options. And so I'm gonna select any cell in here, just one cell though. I've got one cell, I'm gonna insert. I'm gonna go to the insert tab up top and I'm gonna go to the pivot table. It's already in a normal table over here, but I'm gonna create a pivot table and then I'm, it creates the range and it's basically selecting the table. I'm gonna put it into the existing worksheet and I'm gonna delete this bit right there and I'm gonna put it right here in S1 and say, okay. And it gives us our pivot table thing. And I'm basically gonna reverse this so it has the products on the left and the unit and the ending balance up top. So I'm gonna say, all right, let's pick up then the product so i'm looking for the product field and it pulls that into the rows so that looks good i'm going to pull that into the rows very nice and then i want to pick up the unit balance and the ending balance so unit balance it put it where i want it to go which is on this side and it's using the sum so there's the four the five and the three the four the five and the three and then the ending balance and so there we have the ending balance of the 100, the 543, and the 1350. Now, if you make adjustments, if you have a pivot table, for example, if I close this out, it should, it's a nice, easy thing to build. And once it's built up, it's nice, it's nice. But then if you make adjustments over here, your pivot table, you have to right click on it and possibly refresh the pivot table so that so that uh, you can refresh the numbers and if anything gets wonky on the pivot table then you can basically recreate the pivot table once you've done it a few times it's not too difficult and you could format it and whatnot but i'm gonna bring this in a bit maybe i'll do the headers and wrap it over here and center it so i won't get into much more detail on formatting the the pivot table but that could be a little bit faster once you get used to them than creating a table like this. And then you could refresh the pivot table as needed as you're updating your data to the left. And again, if the pivot table, something goes wrong with it, you can always just you know recreate the pivot table from your data set over here once you get the hang of creating a pivot table.